we have a very special guest with us today. We've been talking for a little while about doing the issues of politics and sports, the relationship between there. And who better to have on than the gentleman who founded our beloved Ottawa Senators? We're very honored to welcome Mr. Bruce Firestone to the filibuster today. Well, thanks, John. Thanks to the filibuster. Thanks to CKCU. I'm back in my old haunt and glad to be here. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your association with Carleton. Well, it goes back quite a ways. You know, I, obviously, I'm, I'm best known as the founder of the Ottawa Senators, and we've known each other for a few years now, Five John. Five years now, I think. I think so. And you did a, a fantastic, Thank people you. don't know, at Carleton, John did, and it's on my YouTube channel. Yes, it is. Uh, go <laughs> check it out. Go check Check it out. He did a fantastic history of the Ottawa Senators. It's one of the uh, great uh, pieces of video that, that John has done, and it's gotten thousands of views. Uh, so maybe a few more now. Hopefully. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so uh, when I when I left the Senators, I really wasn't sure what I was going to do. And the president of the time, the president of the University, Robin Farquhar, called me up, and he said, uh, so Bruce, what are you going to do next? I said, uh, hmm. <laughs> Don't know. And he said, well, you have a Ph.D.? And I said, yeah. What's it in? And I said, it's in urban economics. Well, come and teach you the School of Architecture. And I said, uh... Hmm, School of Architecture. You know, I'm a civil engineer. And, uh, and he said, well, we'll find something for you. So I came and, and I taught, uh, you know, my sentence was 14 years. Wow. Excellent. Welcome back. Thank you. So I want to rewind the clock a little bit. So politics and sports, you obviously have a long association with sports in your life. I do, yeah. Tell me a little bit about how politics related to the senator's bid. It's the late 80s, early 90s. You're bidding for the senator's. Yeah. Do they, are the politicians, are they loving you? Is the NCC loving you? Or right. is it a little bit of a battle? Right. Well, uh, you know, anybody who knows uh, uh, much about the sports industry knows that real estate is part of it. And uh, w what we wanted to do was we wanted to buy a National Hockey League expansion franchise. Uh, we thought the NHL was getting ready to expand, and we thought Ottawa was big enough uh, to have a, an NHL team, and, and that we should be and could be the bidder. So we sold 15,000 season tickets for a team that didn't exist. And Who's we, by the uh, we, it was basically myself and the other two founders of the team, Cyril Leader, who then became uh, president of the Ottawa Senators and is now, I think, uh, the president and CEO of uh, the Myers Automotive Group, and Randy Sexton, who's still in the National Hockey League. Mm -hmm. And just let me point out that we interviewed both of these guys in the documentary. That's presentation. right. Incredible men. Truly fantastic they gentlemen. They, they were are. great to me. And, and great community builders and, 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 and probably my dearest friends as well. Absolutely. And uh, so uh, what happened was uh, uh, we uh, we thought we'd bring a National Hockey League franchise to Ottawa. There used to be an NHL team in Ottawa um, uh, for, for, for many years. And when I hear the term original six, it really drives me wild <laughs> because it was the original ten and the Senators won nine Stanley Cups. Who has the most Stanley Cups? You would know that. Montreal Canadiens right? with 24. And number two? Toronto Maple Leafs. Right. And number three is the Senators with yes, nine. And, and so well, when I hear, uh, the, uh, I hear I, this. I hate to cut you off. Brendan, Bruce, you're killing me. I believe, I think it's actually, the, um, uh, I want to say, I because I, I looked this yeah. up the other day, okay. and I think it's the Detroit Red Wings. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm never I'm coming back. I'm going to have to double check that. I can the, look that the up issue right is now. CKCU is definitely off my list now. <laughs> so it's, we're either number three or number four. Let me just point out that we have a bit of a family connection here. We so do. last week we had Barry McLaughlin on the show, yeah. who you, who is of course Brendan's father, yes, he who is. you have some association with. Well, uh, Barry and I have known each other uh, for uh, many decades, and I'm a big fan of his, and he happens to be born on the same day as me. So we're, yes, we're, yes, we're brothers actually. from another mother, Brendan. <laughs> he was mentioning that the other day. Yeah, Detroit Red Wings. Uh, which is 11, but the Toronto Maple Leafs includes uh, the other two names that they were under yeah. over Toronto 100 Sa years ago. Yeah. Let, let me try. Toronto St. Pat's, Toronto Arenas. Yes, uh, ah. Toronto St. Pat's and the Toronto Arenas. Very yeah. good, very good. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm surrounded by hockey fans. I'm going to quit now. <laughs> All right, so I guess I'm not going to quit. So anyway, uh, we, we thought we could uh, bring a National Hockey League uh, team uh, to Ottawa and that there would be support and demand f for that. And, and I know the Senators are, are struggling a little bit, uh, you know, both at the gate and, and uh, you know, at the... Uh, in the bank, so to speak, uh, these days. But it wasn't that long ago that the Ottawa Senators were in the top five, six, seven, or eight in the NHL in revenue. So, so I, I'm quite optimistic. But I'm going to go back 25 or 30 years now and. And we were going to uh, bring the team to Ottawa, and and we bought uh, 600 acres of land in Canada. We decided to put the NHL uh, new NHL building there, which was called originally the Palladium, as you know, John, and is now called Canadian Tire Center, and uh, and you know create a real community out there, uh, homes and and shops and businesses and whatever else going around uh, the arena. So that that was kind of the idea. But uh, real estate is quite controversial in a way. Uh, anytime you do something, there's some always somebody I think, or mostly. 
who might not like you know more traffic or or whatever and uh, you know and so politics does get in, involved and in our case what happened was we had 600 acres of land we submitted it uh, to the city of Ottawa it was actually called the regional municipality of Ottawa Carleton back then but it's now the city of Ottawa and it was approved uh, to you know the rezoning and, and and the construction of a new building and, and really a new a new part of our town um, and I went to Toronto and I visited with the premier and it was uh, David Peterson he was a, a liberal premier and I'm not a political guy I'm not I don't belong to a political party but David was premier at the time and I asked him John for three things I asked him uh, for uh, his support uh, in, in in that December December of 1990 to come down to Palm Beach at the winter meetings at the NHL and tell the NHL uh, what a great place uh, Ontario was to invest. And if you think about uh, back back then, there were two NHL teams in Quebec, uh, the Nordiques and the Canadians, and two in uh, Alberta. And, and just explain why maybe Ontario should have two or maybe even three. And so the premier said, oh, that's kind of interesting. And then he... Uh, uh, I asked him for a priority. I said, I don't expect any special favors from the province when you're re reviewing excuse me, our uh, zoning application, but I don't want it to be held up by your dad's uh, renovation project. I want the, every ministry to give it a priority. And he said, that sounds reasonable. And I said, there is one other thing. This is not a sky dome, because the sky dome was a, a, a big morass for the province at that time. It was estimated to cost $150 million, ended up costing $650 million, and $500 million of of that is in the province of Ontario's debt. They, uh, they cover the debt. I said, we're not asking for any uh, guarantees uh, from the province, but we do want one thing. We want a $30 million interchange on the major highway that uh, serves this particular site. And that's a $30 million cost. We would like uh, the province to, 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 to do that. It is public infrastructure. Uh -huh. And uh, Mr. Peterson agreed. So uh, we had uh, some documents go back and forth between the province and our company, which was Terrace Investments, uh, uh, Inc., the first parent company of the senators. And uh, life looked pretty good until Mr. Peterson did something that no premier, I think, will ever do again. He called an election two and a half years early. And... Um, and usually we have elections in Ontario every four years, plus or minus, and you know a few months. And and he called it to an because he was riding high in the polls. And people in Ontario got mad at him, and they elected Bob Ray. He became uh, premier with the NDP, and the NDP was very strong in Hamilton. So they decided to support the Hamilton bid. And the next thing I know, I got a letter from uh, Mr. Ray saying, "Oh, you remember those three promises that Mr. Peterson uh, made? Well, sorry, you know the province uh, is is you know struggling financially, so we can't build the the inner." change and um, I'm so busy I, I can't possibly come to the NHL winter meetings in in December 1990 and oh by the way we'll use all the power of the Ontario government to oppose your rezoning so that was pretty bad pretty bad indeed so how did it end tell me about your experiences with the NCC because Canada right. was not your original pick for the arena. Well, we we looked at uh, five different sites John um, yeah, we looked at um, South Keys, if you know where that oh, is. Yeah. yeah, and we like that site. Uh, we looked at uh, um, East End at 174 in Orleans, uh, the Highway 174 in Orleans, and then we looked at where the Casino de Lac Lime is now um, uh, in, in Quebec, which was a beautiful site. You know, it's got a lake. Absolutely. And it's five minutes from downtown Ottawa. Uh, we looked at Le Breton Flats because the NCC had expropriated the land, you know, 50, 60 years ago and hadn't done anything with it. And, uh, and we also looked in, in Canada. And, and one by one, the sites fell away. And what happened was I went to see then chair of the NCC, the National Capital Commission, Jean Piggott. And I asked Jean if she would consider letting uh, the senators, you know, put a, an arena there. And, uh, and she said, do you want the public answer or the private answer? And I said, Mrs. Piggott, are, are, are they different? And she said, they are. And I said, well, What's the private answer? Well, the private answer is no. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, I'm sure you're going to build a rink, even a very nice rink, but it's, to us it's just a rink. The NCC has a 150-year plan for, for those lands, maybe a, a new museum, which turned out to be the War Museum, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a new Supreme Court of Canada building. So we're not going to uh, make any space there for a hockey rink. And... Um, uh, and I said, well, what, what's the public answer, uh, Gene? And she said, well, we don't like to turn down Canadians. So we, we, we say publicly, uh, that's an interesting idea. We'll study it until one of two things happens, Bruce. What is that, uh, Mrs. Bigot? Uh, you either give up and go away or you die, whichever comes first. <laughs> so not the biggest support. So let's go. <laughs> <laughs> not, not at all. Let's no. pivot a bit. So now sure. the winter meetings in 1990. 
You've got the franchise. You're on the stage with with uh, Phil Esposito and John Ziegler. Oh my gosh, you really know the stuff, right? <laughs> you must have done a video. I must have done a video. There you go. Who passed away recently, unfortunately, Mr. Ziegler. Yeah, he did. Announcing that you have now brought an NHL team to Ottawa. Yeah. You get back to Ottawa. Yeah. Were there parades? Was Bob Ray calling you a hero to the province? <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, what actually happened uh, was about two or three weeks after I got back to Ottawa from Palm Beach, and we it was pretty exciting. We raised about $22.5 million in season ticket sales in, in 10 days, and and a lot of things were going our way. And Phil, Phil Esposito, who was fronting the Tampa Bay Lightning, that's our sister city, really, in the NHL, uh, or brother city, I guess. And, uh, and, and, and he said, oh, I got a really nice call from the governor of the state of Florida saying, thanks for bringing NHL hockey to, uh, to, to, to Florida, and we're really excited about having you here, so anything I can do. How, how was your reaction when you got back? And I said, well, I got a lawsuit. <laughs> From the government, what was the lawsuit about? Well, we went to the, um, uh, the that summer of 1991. We went to an OMB hearing, Ontario Municipal Board hearing, which is a land board appeal sort of thing, tribunal, I guess. And uh, it was a 13 and a half week hearing. It cost us, I think, two and a half to three million dollars in legal fees and planning fees. So I was actually on the stand for three and a half days defending uh, what we were doing. Uh, you know, I do have some some background, some academic and practical background, so I, I was able to 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 defend it. But you know, I kind of say that the lawyer that the the province of Ontario, he was a hot shot lawyer. We call him the Perry Mason of, of OMB <laughs> lawyers. I don't know if you guys are too oh, young yeah. to understand Perry Mason, but the Perry Mason of OMB lawyers, in and he he was pretty tough on me, but I, 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 we got through it, and in September of 1991, we did get approval. Excellent. So I'm going to pivot away a little bit from the Ottawa Senators right sure. now. Uh, one thing that we've seen a consistent issue around the country, and really all across North America, is the issue of taxpayer money going to fund arenas. So right. Edmonton, this was a huge issue. They did get their arena belt, right. not before their owner was publicly taking tours of Seattle, right. threatening to move the team. Calgary, this is an enormous issue right Big now. Big issue. What's your take on it? Is it justifiable for taxpayer money to fund arenas? Well, I, I have a, a different view of it. Uh, I look at it from the point of view of a developer. You know, I've been a hockey guy. I've been a real estate developer. I've been a prof. Uh, you know, somebody says, well, what are you going to be when you finally grow up, Bruce? <laughs> and, uh, well, so now I do some coaching. The older I get, the less doing I do and the more uh, coaching. I do some real estate investment and business coaching now, uh, John. I, I like that. Mm -hmm. Teaching young people has always been a, a great passion of mine. Um, but, you know, I, I take it a little bit of a different view. Governments take a long time to make decisions. You know, they, they're, they're spending public dollars. They have to be careful. They have to, you know, governments don't like to do anything without a study. Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, like me uh, are, you know, sort of hell-bent on being entrepreneurs. You know, ask my wife. <laughs> uh, she's put up with me for 33 years. I, I don't know how she's ever done that, but she has. I love her dearly. Hi, Don. Uh, and, uh, and so, um, you know, I, I just have a different take on it. I, I'm, I'm about speed to action and, and getting things done. So I coach a lot of young people, you know, hundreds of them and taught thousands. And, and I, I'm about taking action and, and getting things done. So, so to wait, uh, you know, maybe years or in this case, decades. I mean, the, the, going back to the centers for a moment, I will come back to your question about Calgary, but going back to, to the centers for a mo moment, if you think about it, the NCC under new leadership has had a change of heart uh -huh. and they want to animate the Le Breton site and they don't want to just have museums there and, and maybe a, a new uh, court building. Uh, they, they, they would accept, I think, and in fact, they would, uh, you know, a new arena and thousands of housing units and, and shops and all kinds of cool stuff. So, so, but I would have had to wait 25 or 30 years, that's not an entrepreneurial solution. You with me on that? Yeah. And it's not reasonable. So I, if, you know, I'm not giving Calgary any advice, either the owner or the city, but uh, I, I think there are a lot of things that government can do without actually spending any money. Excellent. What's interesting now about the way what's happening with the Calgary situation was, of course, Mayor Nenshin was a, Mayor Nenshi, I should say, Nenshi, yeah. was an enormous opponent of this funding bill. Right. We got to a situation where Gary Bettman was just barely stopping short of endorsing his opponent in the election. <laughs> he was, his exact words, yeah. I believe, were, you know, Calgarians need to make a choice for their future. Right. What's right. best going forward? Right. And the Flames need a new arena. They do. They absolutely do. I'm not. I'm not saying they don't. Is that appropriate at all for a commissioner to be saying? Well, you know, one of the things I've learned is Gary Bettman, as commissioner, I've known him for a long time. You know, is a a, a pretty strict individual, mm -hmm. strict with owners and even former owners. Mm -hmm. If you follow what I'm saying, I follow what you're so saying. So, to, for me to comment on anything that, that, that <laughs> Gary does is probably not a good thing to, for me to do. Okay, enough. but. Uh, coming back to to Calgary again, or the Ottawa situation uh, back in the day, 
uh, you know, governments can do a lot of things. They, they can certainly do uh, a lot with a, what I call the magic wand. They have a magic wand, which is like zoning approvals and upzoning and more density. And I actually did a study for Hamilton, believe it or not, because I think we should have a, a, an NHL franchise in Hamilton. I certainly. believe that. And we should have another one in Quebec. Uh, I mean, we should have, I guess, nine franchises in Canada, maybe more, but certainly nine are justified, in my opinion. And I did a study for Hamilton which showed uh, without uh, writing a check, um, uh, you could self-capitalize or bootstrap, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars because there's all kinds of uh, revenue streams that you can capitalize. And governments can make that more available to you simply by upzoning, if you understand, more density, more intensity, different types of uses. And there's a lot of other things that governments can do, like in, in the Canadian Tire Center, we had a budget of $240 million to build that building. Today, it would be at least $650 million, but that's 25 sure. years ago. And out of the $240 million budget, what I wanted was I wanted $30 million from the government of Ontario to build what is public in in infrastructure and interchange. And the government of Canada at the time, I think Mr. Crenshaw might have been prime minister, gave us $5 million for, for technology enhancement. But substantially all of the budget was private money. Certainly. Um, it just, 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 just going back to Calgary. Uh, how does how does it feel? Uh, Hamilton, I think, is a great idea for an NHL franchise. And, to and come. that city, the Brandon, fan base will the fan base will the come. fan base will be there. And that city is coming, man. Uh, you know, people call it Steel City, and they, you know, even my wife was talking about Hamilton because I have clients in Hamilton, and you know how 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 down at the mouth is. I said, uh, honey, uh, we got to go next next time we're in the Toronto area. We got to visit Hamilton. It's, it's completely mm -hmm. changed. Absolutely, it, it certainly is. He's got all these different neighborhoods uh, c coming together uh, to, to form this great town in, in, in it Canada. Is. It's a lot bigger than you would think. It is. Uh, I actually had the pleasure of going to Hamilton for the first time this summer, and I absolutely absolutely loved it. Um, uh, about Calgary, though, how does it feel when you hear that the, the people of Calgary voted no to host the Olympics? Well, that's a different that's subject. Ridiculous. I know it's a different subject. Yeah. It involves more money and more infrastructure, but, yeah. but the infrastructure is there. We, yeah. got, we, we have a dying tourism uh, industry in Canada. We need to bring people to the country. People should not be voting no against us. They should be saying yes every single time. Well, here's the thing. Um, uh, you know, uh, the Olympics is a different thing, in my opinion, than anything else, because it's all about branding your country. Uh, if you guys remember the Vancouver Olympics and, and Sid's Golden Goal. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, I can't tell you the number of new Canadians, uh, immigrants, people who have been, lived in this country for, for decades, uh, uh, how it brought us together. And then I was watching, I, I watched some of the coverage on NBC. And, you know, uh, uh, as you probably know, Brendan, Americans kind of think the world stops at their borders. You know, yeah. there's a thing called American exceptionalism. And president after president has talked about that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I once had a girlfriend from, uh, from New York. She was a producer for NBC. Wow. And uh, that's a long time ago, John. No. I'm happily married, by the way. Um, and, 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 you know, we, were, we had a lot of fun together, and uh, I won't, won't give you all the details. But, um, uh, you know, when she found out it was Canadian, she started talking to me slower. <laughs> and and I, I really noticed it. And I said, did my IQ drop? She said, what, what are you talking about? Well, did my IQ drop suddenly, you know? And she said, well, she couldn't understand. And uh, that was a, a relationship that was doomed, you can imagine. So... So there is a thing called American exceptionalism, and uh, and uh, I, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> it's perfectly. What out. was the question, Brendan? It the was Olympics. Olympics. Oh, yeah. The question okay, okay. How, how does, I, I, I obviously it. I was obviously dictating. <laughs> I, a little bit. I was thinking about a girl, right? Yes. That, that is a <laughs> distraction. I. No, I'm kidding. Just joking. Uh, <laughs> so no, I, I do have a point. So. Uh, it, you know, with the when I was watching NBC coverage of the Vancouver Olympics, I think that was 2010, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. A yeah. And and they said, oh my gosh, you know, Vancouver's such a great city, and and Canadians are so nice, and, and their cities are so neat and tidy and clean, and wow, I could really see myself living here. And and that kind of branding is really important. You guys are all young here. In the millennial generation, I've got five kids. They're all young, in in their twenties, and and um, they they are the most brand conscious generation ever. Mm. I was teaching in Stockholm a few years ago at Hyper Island. I was teaching digital data strategy to sixty one or sixty two of the top students there. And the first day on the job, uh, when I was teaching them, I asked them to get their laptops out, and 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 they did. And I burst out laughing. One of the girls said, "What are you laughing at, professor?" And I I said, "Well, come on up here and turn around. What do you see?" And she said, 
just a bunch of students. And I said, no, look more carefully. 61 out of 62 students had that, that Apple logo staring uh-huh. at me in the face. And I said, you guys are the most impressionable brand conscious ever. And I asked the one guy, the poor guy, I picked on him. Uh, he was a Russian student. Uh, uh, how come you don't have um, you know, a MacBook Pro for 3,500 euros? Oh, he said in his Russian accent, I, I got uh, my, build my own computer, you know, maybe 800 euro, but much better. <laughs> <laughs> and and I do the same thing, by the way. I build my own computers, or I have uh, some help f- from uh, one of my guys. And, uh, y- you know, I mean, I'm not saying Apple doesn't make good computers. Obviously, they do. But, you know, are they really worth two or 2,500 euros more? Probably not, right? So brand consciousness is really important. And so to establish a Canadian brand internationally is really important. And you hit touched on a really important point. Uh, and that is, can we can we boost tourism in Canada? And that is an important industry. Don't don't think it isn't. It's important to Ottawa. We get five or six million uh, mm-hmm. tourists oh, a yeah. year, mm-hmm. and Vancouver, I think, even more. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I look at it quite differently. That's a mm-hmm. branding exercise. Well, we have uh, like I went to Banff, Alberta last year, and I noticed there was a lot more people there who are looking for work than there are people who are just going to to vacation there. Right. And you know, you'd be pretty disappointed to come all the way out to a Canadian uh, tourism town to not really yeah. get paid as much, not to see as many people as you thought you would. Yeah. You're just seeing a lot of I, Australians I, yeah. who want to take your jobs. Yeah, you know? I, have a, I have a daughter out there, you know, she's <laughs> yeah. real cute, like her mom, and, and she's out there looking in, in Banff right now, looking for a job. She's a young person, and she's, you know, having an adventure, and I, I support that. Uh, but uh, building building a, a great tourism uh, industry does require a, a national branding exercise. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I, I lived in Australia for a number of years. My PhD is from the Australian National University in Canberra, and... Um, and, and the Aussies really get it. I mean, oh my God, they brand like heck. And 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 then you release a film like Crocodile Dundee. I don't know if you guys oh, yeah. even know that film, but you know. And then and then your tourism literally doubles. It's a, it's an interesting thing about the Olympics because, on the one hand, branding is enormously important. That's a, that's huge. On the other hand, I think one of the things that people think about is you have kind of the albatross of the Montreal Olympics. Almost kind of hanging over your head. Yeah, but you know, look uh, again. I'm an entrepreneur. You can't look back. Right. You know. I mean, I wish I could report to you, John, and, and your crew here that everything in my career has has just been going, you know, vertical <laughs> up. You know, no, that's not true. Entrepreneurs go through ups and downs, and and I, I, I teach a lot of people, and they've gone through ups and downs, and 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 unfortunately, that's just part of the of life, really. I think mm-hmm. uh, for a lot of people, and uh, what I say to people who are experiencing some downs is that you have three days. The first day you can be sad. You know, uh, you know. The second. Day you can be mad and the third day get up and get some exercise get on with your life and this same thing is true with the Montreal thing Montreal is a happening place it's Absolutely. one of the most fantastic tech towns and and uh, video uh, gaming towns and and entertainment and and just on and on and on it's uh, you know I've got lots of students from this university uh, practicing architecture in Montreal oh, and oh my gosh are they doing well so just get over it there's the that's, the, that's a relevant point, but the issue that I think people are most concerned about is cost. So the argument from a lot of Calgarians was, why should we be spending billions of dollars yeah. on something that's going to be over in two weeks? We need hospitals. We need right. infrastructure. Right. We need this. We need that. Well, that, that's a valid argument in a way, but that's because most people don't really understand what a modern, how a modern era economy works. Okay, Mm -hmm. a modern era economy is about creating more options. If you think back 10,000 years ago or 100,000 years ago when we had primitive humans, and, and, and certainly early parts of recorded history, uh, more pie for you, John, meant less for me. Right. Okay? So no question about that. But today, uh, if you look at, say, you create a, a, an app like Uber, right, on your phone or Airbnb on your phone, the more people who use it, or for that matter, the Google search engine or the Bing search engine, more people who use it, the more valuable it becomes for everybody. Right. So it's not necessarily that a modern economy means there's only a certain fixed amount of pie. And that's what people don't understand. If we can grow the pie, if we can grow our tur- tourism industry, if we can grow other industries, uh, it's not a two-week fiasco. And there's another thing is that Calgary has an opportunity to build on infrastructure. So, for example, the Flames new, need a new arena. And part of having a new right. uh, the Olympic bid would involve building a new arena. The Stampeders right. new, need a new stadium. Yeah. And their plans are basically to... Almost in the way the TD place has done it, where the arena and the football field are sort of together, right. it'd be a very similar idea. Right. Well, I think TD place is a really good example of where you can bring uh, people like Jeff Hunt, the owner mm-hmm. of the 67s, and and uh, I think the master of, uh, of marketing and sports in Ottawa oh, yeah. uh, with the Red Blacks. I mean, they're a fantastic organization. Uh, but they, they, they have Minto there and Shankman there and Trinity there. These are three great uh, local companies, and uh, they, they have done amazing, amazing things to create something that is um, 
It's not just sports, but it's sports, it's entertainment. And there's a uh, residential, uh, you know, development there. There's obviously lots of commercial and shops and learning opportunities and, and fun, and and it all works. One thing about TD Place that is interesting is that you write. I've read your blog a little bit, or your Tumblr, I should say, and yeah. you talk a, bit, a lot about not in my backyarders. Yeah, I wasn't going to use that expression, but I was thinking that. <laughs> exactly. You read my mind, there, right? I, I didn't know mind. you could do that. Well, you learn something new every day. I did. <laughs> What happened with the Lansdowne situation, now it's an incredible success. It is. Building it was a bit of a fiasco. We had the Friends of Lansdowne. We had the lawsuits. Yeah. Why do people... Why, what is the situation there where people will say, this is something that is going to revitalize this area, and it has. It's incredible. Yeah. I don't want it in my backyard. I don't want the traffic. Where does that come from? Well, people fear change. You know, like if you think about primitive humans again, uh, you know, you, 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 you go to the berry bush. Mm-hmm. And and there's berries there, and you collect the berries, you bring them home, and, and you, you feed your family. And then you go back to the berry bush, and you do it again, so you have some experience. Then somebody says, "Look, uh, how about uh, if uh, if we you know we have this new thing called torches, and we could go and we could double production of, ber- of berries if we could pick at night." But primitive humans didn't like to be out at night because they were. Uh, Prey, right? Uh, Saber tooth tigers would come and eat you and your family. So change to most of us equals fear. And I think that is a fundamental uh, thing about human beings. Did you have to deal with that sort of sit? situation of people not wanting the senators in their backyard? Was that a situation? Yeah, it, it, it was uh, for sure. I remember uh, we had one a farmer, I won't mention his name, a nice man. He had a farm out there and he, he really was concerned about, you know, uh, more traffic and, and, and losing farmland and, and all the other things that, that I think uh, he, he sincerely meant. But I remember the CBC went out and interviewed him on the 10th anniversary of the opening of the Palladium, Canadian Tire Center. And uh, I actually watched that interview, and and I was flabbergasted when they asked him, uh, so you were an opponent of the uh, of, of the building back in the day. You, you went every day to the OMB hearing that I mentioned earlier in this interview. Uh, for 13 and a half weeks, you were there every day for a farmer. That's a lot of a big time commitment. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, and he said, oh, no, no, I was never an opponent. <laughs> I just yeah. wanted to make sure, I just wanted to make sure that they went through the process and it was a fair process and it was uh, thorough. Uh, but the Palladium has been a, a great partner. Uh, you know, it's, it's increased uh, traffic in front of my farm. The farm gate marketing that I do has gone way up. I'm more successful now. No, I'm a supporter. That's interesting because I grew up five minutes away from where mm-hmm. the arena was. Okay. So I've lived my whole life around that area. Right. And I've seen it kind of happen almost in real time. The yeah. mm-hmm. infrastructure around there popping up. Two th- you know, 96, you get the yeah. Walmart out there. Yeah. Now you have the whole Canada Centrum. You have yeah. the movie theaters. Yeah. And all those people who opposed it back then, I guarantee you they would not want to live without the stuff well, that wouldn't exist pe- without people, it. People, uh, you know, kind of revise history a little bit. I mean, as did this uh, particular individual I, I, I just mentioned. But but there's another there's other factors, too, that you, you know, John, uh, about uh, sports teams. Uh, you know, I, I was wearing my Buffalo Bills hat oh, when yes. I came here. I, I took five of my kids uh, to, to the home opener for the Buffalo Bills this year. Oh, excellent. And, and you know. Uh, not a great game for them. Uh, it was really, really bad. I think it was 28. <laughs> six at halftime yeah. but, but uh, um, I, I really had a great time uh, not only because my kids were there but Buffalo uh, the people were fantastic mm-hmm. 120,000 people show up for tailgating at 630 in the morning mm-hmm. and I, I estimated that each home game means a million dollars to the property owners who are close to that stadium for us we parked uh, our, our van in a parking lot a church parking lot and they mm-hmm. charged I think $20 they ran a 50-50 draw I'm not sure it's licensed <laughs> um, and the closer you got to the new era field where the bills play the, the more you paid uh, but I estimate about a million dollars went into the, the the local property owners there and and Buffalo you know uh, it, it, it's it's not a, a wealthy town like Toronto right. and and it certainly could use a boost and this is 120,000 people show up at 6:30 in the morning on game days to, to tailgate and all, the, the arena or the stadium only holds 80,000 people and one lady she was a middle-aged lady it was about 9:30 by that time she comes up to me and says listen Sonny I got one thing to say to you. I said, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I haven't been called Sonny in a while. <laughs> and and w- one thing to say to you, you can't drink all day. I said, uh, okay, unless you start in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you got lots of off- Yeah, it's true. True story. Uh, lots of officers, police officers there, you know, to keep order, obviously, and to protect against uh, maybe uh, terrorism and other uh, acts, uh, which might be unfortunate, but the uh, 
good good feeling amongst the community. You, people do drink, uh, you know, somewhat, mm-hmm. and uh, other substances might be uh, consumed. And uh, but it's uh, it it really brings the community together. And one of the things that I've often thought about is that that everybody who lives in Ottawa they they may not know that, but they belong to Team Ottawa. Mm-hmm. If if I lived in Calgary, even though I'm the founder of the Ottawa Centers, I certainly would be cheering for the Flames mm-hmm. because if your local hockey team or your local football team, like the Red Blacks, are doing well, it, it, it you know it, it creates a, a good feeling, and a good feeling leads to positive decisions. So uh, let's say you, John, you owned a, a company, and you're thinking about are you going to make that next investment, that next expansion, the next hire, and you come in and you feel good, and everybody around you feels good, you're more likely to make a positive decision. It's interesting. Why do you think is sort of the underlying psychology that what sports does to a community and what these sports teams do to bring people together? Well, it used to be going to church, I think, that, that brought mm-hmm. people together and, and they they rallied around a common cause. But, um, you know, when I was teaching in, in, in Sweden, like I was saying earlier, um, I found out that 95% of Swedes don't, don't, uh, uh, don't believe in God. Really? Yeah, 95%, and they just don't believe in such things. And uh, listen, I'm, I'm not here to talk about uh, what people believe politically or what they what their religious views are. Uh, I think people should be free to make those choices. But 95%, that was a really shocking thing. So so how do you rally a community? What do you rally around? I mean, again, going back to Sid's Golden Goal in 2010, I, I think, I don't remember what the viewership was of that game, but was it 15 or 18 million? It was million? astronomical. I, I think astronomical it might have been 18 was. million people, yeah. And, and, and can you get 18? million people to watch Prof. Bruce on TV? <laughs> no. Possibly. No. We'll, we'll give it a shot. No, I don't. <laughs> no, we need about 18 million shots. <laughs> there, it's interesting because what's happening now in the sports world is that, let me put it to you this way. We're seeing now a backlash against sports teams. People are talk about how sports teams are on the decline, how team... I was watching a New England Patriots game a couple weeks ago in New England Patriots, five Super Bowls in the last yeah, 20 years. Unbelievable. My team, by the way, we had a terrible loss last week, but we're, gonna, we're getting to another Super Bowl. Okay, this we are. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I expect that. AFC East, don't worry, we'll be playing each other in a couple weeks. Right. People are saying that sports teams are on the decline and that people are losing interest and that attendance is falling in various sports leagues. Do you think that's true? Well, you know, again, uh, I think... Uh, um, Things go in cycles, uh, you know, and and everything has a birth, a life, and a death. Everything, mm-hmm. our planet, one day will have a, have a death. I think, uh, a long time from now, we hope. But um, you know, I think leagues have to continually adapt. You know, it's adapt or die. You're either growing or you're dying. There's no such thing as the status quo. And so I, I think that certainly the National Football League and the CFL as well have, and the National Hockey League have to cope with, you know, injuries and they have to cope with concussions and they have to cope with other things that are thrown their way. So they have to adapt or die. So and it's it's it's, it's true in business. It's true I think for government and or, other organizations, not for profits charities and it'll be just as true for sports leagues. I'm glad you brought up the concussions issue because that is now an enormous issue. Do you think this presents the existential threat to sports, to football and hockey, namely football and hockey, that some people are expecting it does? Well, you know, I, I, I would let my sons, I have two boys and three girls, I'd let my sons and my daughters play hockey, um, you know, uh, in, in case of the boys, contact hockey, uh, but I probably wouldn't let them play football. Really? Yeah, yeah. You know, I have a lot of friends who've played football, and of course, m- many who've played professional hockey and, and amateur hockey. And uh, and, and you know, uh, at fifty, they they look like they're seventy. Wow. Uh, they feel like they're eighty. Um, you know, one of my friends, uh, you know, he, he it takes him about a half an hour in in, in a hot shower uh, just to get you know, mobile every morning, he would be 55 now. Um, and if you look at uh, the life expectancy for former football players, it is it is quite a bit shorter, I think, than the average person. Especially with all the high profile cases we've seen recently. Aaron yeah. Hernandez yeah. is probably the big one. Yeah, for sure. Junior Seau, I could go yeah. on and on. Yeah. There was the movie Concussion that came out a few yeah. years ago. Yeah. Was that with Will Smith? Will Smith. Yeah, and, and so uh, I, I do think that the leagues will have to, to adapt. You know, like for example, people ask me about fighting in hockey and I'm opposed to it. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, for a lot of reasons, uh, you know, I'm a father of five and I have two little grandsons. Uh, I, I don't want my grandsons playing hockey and, and, and getting their brains beat in. I do not want that. Plus, on top of that, society has changed, uh, John. When, when I was a boy uh, back in the, the 60s, um, you know, uh, uh, um, it, it, you know, I, I boxed. Mm-hmm. I was a boxer. And, and, uh, and I, I, I was a brawler. 
I mean, people don't know that about me. I'm an old guy now, right? But I was a brawler back then. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we got into fights. We had street fights. We, you know, we had gangs. We had French gangs. We had English gangs. We had all, we had, I think, I, I don't even remember the names. They weren't the Crips, but they, <laughs> I think they were the Squirrels and something else. And, 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 and they fought. And we fought. And, and we scrapped. We were young boys, and, and that's what we did. And, but the world has changed. We, we don't put up with bullying the way we did in, in our schools. I mean, bullying, oh, my gosh. You, you got bullied. And if you didn't stand up for yourself, you really got bullied. Right. None of my kids had that, and nor would we want them to have those experiences. So society has changed. And like I was saying, if leagues don't change, they, they will die. The way I see it, too, is that fighting leads, I'm, I'm completely, I agree with you on fighting mm -hmm. in hockey. It leads to a unique culture. So I think of what was the most horrifying incident in hockey I can think of the past few years. There's been a lot. There's been a few. For me, it goes down to Todd Bertuzzi and Steve Moore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's ben, the most. Ben was literally just saying. Yeah. 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 The yeah. Mo I can't watch that video to this no. day. It's no. a horrific video. And the fact that Steve yeah. Moore never played again is horrendous. Yeah, it's bad. What, that video, the way, or that play, I'm going to go out on a limb, though, and assume that Bertuzzi did not intend to end Steve Moore's career. Moore, yeah. in the previous game, had injured the captain of the Canucks, Marcus Nasdaq. Right, I remember that. Bertuzzi was seeking retribution. I'll guarantee you that what Bertuzzi was trying to do was to hit Moore so Moore would turn around and fight him. Right. The exact same thing with the Marty McSorley incident where he clubbed Donald Brashear over the head. Right. He was trying to get him to turn around right. and fight. It leads to a scenario where people are trying to coerce these fights, yeah. and thankfully fighting in hockey is down. These incidents, now it's more but, dirty but, checks but, than you see. You know, but. look, uh, in, in college hockey, you fight, you're gone, right? Yes. So so I, I, I think it's time for the NHL to recognize that society just doesn't want to tolerate <laughs> this behavior. And, and, and they have to protect, you know, the most important assets. 50% of the value of any uh, National Hockey League franchise is in its player contracts. Mm -hmm. I mean, how valuable is... You know, Mark Stone to the Ottawa Senators. You know, it's incredible. Inqu incredible. And, 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 you know, it, you just have to protect the, these, these assets. And they're human beings. They are human. And that's where the real issue comes from for me is the morality issue. And the stories that we've heard of the NFL knowing that what was happening with the concussions and not sharing it on and not passing it on to the players, players needing to literally sue to get their medical records. Right. That's where the real issues are for me. Yeah, I, I don't understand that. You know, like uh, if you look at most uh, uh, scandals, if you will, whether it's uh, National Hockey League or or political scandals, it's always about the cover up. You know, like I was taught as a uh, as a young man, as a boy, really, uh, that uh, to take responsibility for your actions. And uh, I, I try and do the right thing, but I, I'll admit I'm not a perfect person. And when I do the wrong thing, I, I'm I, just because of my upbringing. I, I'll admit that, and, and let's see if we can work something out. Uh, but that's just not the reaction of, uh, of a lot of people. It's like, let's cover it up. And, mm -hmm. and, and it just makes things worse, in my opinion. I want to, we're slowly running out of time here. Yeah, we I are. I kind of want to return to something that you had discussed earlier. The public infrastructure around the Canadian Tire Center. Mm. The interchange. Yeah, we built that. Exactly. We paid for that. So keep that in mind. To anyone in Canada, whenever you drive across that yeah, interchange. Can I have 50 cents, please? <laughs> I'll give you my address after the uh, show's over. That was built by Terrace Investments. Why did you have to build that? Well, uh, as you know, uh, Mr. Ray became uh, premier. And uh, what, what they were really hoping is that the Ottawa Senators would somehow magically move to, to Hamilton and become the Hamilton whatever. And uh, it just shows a lack of understanding of how leagues actually work. Um, the night before we actually got the team, John, I, you know the story. Yeah. I was at a, one of those NHL family dinners. You know, it's like 600, 700 people there. And one of the members of the Board of Governors came up to me and said, uh, Bruce, uh, there's just one thing I want to say to you. And I said, yeah, yes, sir. You will never, ever, ever get an NHL franchise in Ottawa. And he's one of the voters who the next day is going to vote. I said, well, um, well, sir, you know, I, I would say to you that y you should, I believe the NHL should give franchises to communities that love the game, uh, love the league, and will treasure them. And that would be Ottawa. And I'd ask you to reconsider. He said, well, you heard what I had to say. I'm not changing my mind. You will never, ever, ever in an NHL franchise in Ottawa. And, and you've got to remember, I had spent three or four years of my life campaigning to get a team. We'd bought $7.5 million worth of land. We'd spent 2 .5 or $3 million in the bid. And we had 15,000 season tickets and hundreds of thousands of people running to their radios every uh, 20 minutes for an update. How are we doing? And I said to uh, Cyril Leader and Randy Sexton a little later after I got that comment that, geez, if we don't get this franchise, i, I got to find a new hometown. <laughs> uh, moving. And, and I said, we just got to keep going. I mean, maybe that's one vote we're not going to get. 
So we just kept on going. And the next morning, uh, we got up uh, early. The entrepreneurs are up early, most of them. And uh, we went down and, and had breakfast with the NHL Board of Governors and even the, the gentleman who had said that to me. And we kept saying, you know, remember Ottawa, think about Ottawa. Uh, and I looked around the room, and there was only one other bidder there, and that was Phil Esposito from Tampa Bay saying the same thing, more or less. And, uh, and and I said, I wonder where Milwaukee and Seattle and Houston and Portland and uh, St. Pete's and, and, and all these other guys are. Uh, did I mention Hamilton? Nobody else was there just filling me. I said, this is great. We got a couple hours at breakfast, and then at 8 o'clock in the morning, the NHL Board of Governors closes the door, and then they make uh, a decision. And three weeks after uh, the, the, the award of the franchise, I got a call from that member of the Board of Governors, and he said, Bruce, do you remember what I told you the night before we, we, we picked uh, Tampa and Ottawa? I said, I, I'll never forget that. It'll go with me to my grave. I'm sure that you will never, ever get a team. Um, and the vote was unanimous. I asked John Ziegler that uh, moments after after he told us that we were successful. And he said, well, I wanted to tell you what we really did. What we did was we went around. There was three uh, other members of the board of him, so there were four members of the board. We went to every one of the bidders and said, you will never, ever, ever get a franchise in Milwaukee, Hamilton, St. Petersburg, etc." We wanted to see how people would react. And the only two people who kept fighting for a franchise were you and Phil, and that's who we gave it to. So uh, it, it, it turns out that they, maybe they don't give franchises to cities. They give them to people who care. They give them to people who won't back down. There you go. Shameless plug. <laughs> well, I did write a story for the 25th <laughs> anniversary. Thanks for that, John. Uh, called "Don't Back Down." Uh, it, it it doesn't just talk about the history of the centers. It talks about the the economics of uh, big league hockey. It talks about uh, you know a little bit about real estate and, and those kind of issues. And and it's a personal history too. Uh, I think you've read it, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thousands of people have. And if they want it, they can go to my website. Is it okay if I mention it? Absolutely. Yeah. It's BruceMFirestone.com. I think it's nine dollars and 95 cents for a, a electronic copy of it. It's a pretty good book, I think. It definitely is. And also, that event was where I had the opportunity to screen the documentary that I had helped That's develop, right. And that was an amazing experience. Oh, that was a fantastic event. We, you did a great job. Thank you. We got a standing ovation, and that was just an amazing moment. That, yeah, it was. I was really happy for you, John. Thank you. So just in our dying minutes, what is your opinion on the LeBreton bid for the Ottawa Senators right now? What do you think is going to happen? Well, you know, I, I'm not uh, on the inside of that, John. Um, that is obviously up to Eugene Melnick of the National Capital Commission, and, and John Ruddy is involved in some way. John Ruddy is the uh, founder and owner of Trinity, which is a well-respected real estate development company, very strong, uh, knowledgeable. Uh, John's also involved uh, through Trinity with the OSEG group, the Auto Sports and Entertainment Group. So uh, John has a great history in football. He's got a great history in commercial development and uh, certainly knows how to get a project of this scale off the ground. you got to remember, it's not just an arena. I think it's about 4,000 or 4,500 residential units and between two and three million square feet of shops and offices. So it's a very important project in Ottawa. If you think about Ottawa, we've got that Zibby project, which is uh, going now. Uh, headed up by uh, uh, windmill developments, uh, you know, between Ontario and Quebec. It's very important. Uh, the Rockcliffe Air Base is another important project. And then, of course, uh, Rendezvous Le Breton at Le Breton Flats. So uh, I, I think there's the horsepower on both sides to get it done, but it's certainly taking a lot of time. Do you think this is the best thing for the senators going forward? I, I do. And, and, you know, certainly if Gene Piggott back in the day had said to me, Bruce, um, uh, we would certainly consider uh, letting you build uh, at Le Breton Flats, we might have done it 25 years ago and probably should have. Interesting. So what I kind of want to finish off with is what do you think the future of the Ottawa senators is going to hold? Well, you know, some people were saying uh, this, particularly this summer, there was a lot of negative publicity around the team that, oh, maybe the team will move. You know, Quebec City wants a team. Maybe Hamilton wants a team. You know, Seattle wants a team. But, you know, Mr. Bettman uh, does not believe, and I agree with him, uh, that you should put franchises on wheels. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the day when I was trying to get a, a team, I went out to Winnipeg and I met with Barry Shanker, who was the owner there. And he asked me a question, do you want a new one or a used one? <laughs> and I burst out laughing. I said, I want a new one, Barry, because he was thinking about selling the Jets. And, and, yeah. and what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to start the new future of the Ottawa Senators with, with somebody else's uh, leftovers. And I didn't want to disenfranchise hundreds of thousands or even a million fans in Winnipeg of the Jets. I thought that was a terrible idea. And Mr. Bettman ag agrees with that. And, uh, you know, he fought very hard to keep the Arizona team in Arizona, yes. in Phoenix or Scottsdale, wherever it is these days. And um, Glendale, I think. Yeah. There you go. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, and and so I, I believe he would fight very hard. In fact, he did when the senators went yes. bankrupt in the mid-2000s. He fought very hard to keep the senators. Uh, you know, we've got the 
you know, Washington capitals, and we've got the Ottawa centers. The you know, we've got the two uh, great uh, capitals of these uh, North American countries. I, I don't think he's going to uh, um, allow it to move, and and he will do everything he can to tr- to prevent that. In my opinion, I think that's certainly true. Uh, one thing that a lot of people, and just in our last few minutes here, yep. once again have been talking about in my area, what's going to be the future of the Canadian Tire Centre once the Senators move? If it was you, what yeah. would you do? Yeah, I, I'm not worried about that at all. Uh, Walmart, some of the Walmart people told me the one thing that they didn't do, uh, that they would redo if they could, was they would have not doubled or tripled, they would have quadrupled the size of their store. So, you, you know, if you're familiar with what they did with the, uh, the Maple Leaf Gardens in oh, Toronto. Yes. it's a Loblaws uh, now. It, it's a Loblaws <laughs> and it's also the Mattamy Athletic Centre, mm-hmm. part of Ryerson University. It's a fantastic renovation of the downtown building, but uh, I I have no doubt that the Canadian Tire Centre could could become something really special. All right, we have a minute left. We are our theme music playing. Bruce, thank you so much for joining us. It was a fantastic John and interview. crew, thumbs up. Thanks so much for coming, Bruce. Thank you, Brandon. You know, one thing that Bruce said that I, I'm unfortunately going to have to disagree with is getting behind the team where you move. I'm a Hamilton Tiger Cats fan <laughs> myself, and I gotta say, go Stamps, go. I don't care. Sorry, <laughs> Bruce. I'm sorry. You're. you're I, 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 would, I agree with you on everything else, but that one. I can't do it. And thank you to all the listeners out there of the filibuster. Uh, John Falcone, thank you for bringing in such a fantastic guest. Um, Bruce, that was great. We'll have you back anytime. Absolutely. Uh, so that's it from me, Ben James, Brennan McLaughlin sitting on the control booth. Another shout out down to everyone listening in su- sunny California, KCOD. Go to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash filibuster CKCU. Comment on who you hear heard in the theme song, who you might want to also hear in the new theme song, and what you thought of this great interview with Bruce Firestone. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great week. CKCU 93.1 FM in Ottawa.